traditional super fun and all about artisan cheese and more to melt your peaceful heart and toast your peaceful life. Coming to you from the Appalachian Mountains of southwestern Virginia, this is the Peaceful Heart Farmcast. Hey, this is Scott Hall from Peaceful Heart Farm, and you are listening to the Peaceful Heart Farmcast. Hello, everybody. Melanie Hall here. I hope you're doing well. The conversation today and every day revolves around the value of tradition, traditional living, traditional food prep and storage, traditional cooking, and of course, traditional raw milk products and artisan cheese. Topics discussed here are designed to create new perspectives and possibilities for how you might add the taste of tradition to your life. But the format's going to change a little bit today. COVID-19 in the year of our Lord 2020 is affecting us all in one way or another. So the podcast format will be a little different. This episode is going to be a farmstead update only because there's a lot of emotional charge around this pandemic virus. And I have lots of things I want to talk about regarding the homestead and our life here in the midst of it. Also, I I just want to take a few minutes to talk with you about how we are doing here and how we're affected by the current world situation. There'll be no recipe today. And I'd love to hear from you about how you are faring as well. Comment on this podcast on our web page or drop me an email. You can email me at melanie at peacefulheartfarm.com. Let me know if you need anything or if I can help out in any way. We are all in this together. If you're new, welcome. This will not be the best representation of my podcast format, so I hope you'll come back again and again to get a better idea of what I do here. Uh, Welcome back to veteran homestead loving regulars who stop by the Farmcast every episode. You make the show happen. So, Homestead Life Updates is going to be a big part of this, and then I'll just have some thoughts on the COVID-19 in the year of our Lord 2020. First of all, let me talk about the cows. Um, Violet has recovered from her uterine infection and is doing fine. Claire is due to calve in 7 to 10 days. She is so big. I let her take her time coming up to the milking shed. And uh, Buttercup is also quite big, so they just kind of waddle as they're walking. If I have to walk a long way to gather up one of the girls, it will be Buttercup. This morning, it was all the way to the farthest fence line. She just stood there and watched me as I approached. The others, they all started moving in the right direction, but not Buttercup. Nope, nope. Come and get me, she says. Well, the exercise is wonderful, so I don't mind at all. It's a wonderful walk, and we do have a wonderful piece of property here. All right, the sheep and the goats. uh, The sheep are still more than a month away from their delivery dates and are quite uh, looking quite happy and healthy. There will be no baby goats this year as we are reducing the herd, but the girls, the does, are looking fine. They're shedding their cashmere. We are originally got these particular goats because I wanted to spin and dye my own cashmere yarn for knitting. (laughs) That never happened. We, like just about everybody else who's just starting out, wanted to do everything about which our hearts had ever dreamed. Um, Then reality sets in and you realize that there's only so much time in the day and you must pick and choose your homestead enterprises. Uh, Your focus must be narrowed. After just nine or ten years, we have just about settled on the final look and feel of our homestead. So we have the cows for milking and making cheese, and the sheep are just because we like them, and we like lamb. And the goats are for specific pasture maintenance. So that herd will become much smaller. We currently still have 14 girls out there, and we're going to drop that way down. And perhaps we will not breed them at all. It may be we just keep three or four does that require minimal upkeep. And that's still a work in progress. Um, We are sure that the cashmere girls will eventually be gone completely and replaced with a few meat goats. But as I said, we still have 14 girls. And I think we have three boys. We're just kind of moving through those a little bit at a time. I hope next year will be the year 
of the pigs and chickens. The creamery will be completed or nearly so and pigs and chickens, those pigs and chicken projects can move forward. Um, pigs and chickens are a natural part of any cheese making operation. They will get any messed up cheese and all the way that would otherwise be poured out on the field. They get that. So, you know, we, they, we can feed them for a very little cost. And we can do something with this. That's other. They're, they're high protein, nutritious foods, and they'll keep those animals happy and healthy. And then, of course, the animals provide us with meat and eggs. So it's a nice little cycle. Now, let me talk about the orchard because Scott loves the orchard, but I have often wondered what we were going to do with all that fruit. I think we have 19 apple trees. And I'm going to tell you that one apple tree is more than two people could use. So we have 19. And I don't remember how many peach trees, plum trees. We have cherry trees. We have nut trees. and We have all kinds of stuff out there. And as I said, enterprises must be prioritized. And just thinking about we would have, how, how would we have the time to pick, to store, to preserve and market that much fruit? That's a daunting task. But the pigs are the solution. We keep whatever we need for ourselves and the rest will be food for the pigs. So you don't have to do, all you gotta do is pick it and give it to them. <laughs> they will love it. And so we can still have this giant orchard. Well, it's not really giant. We can still have this orchard that is far too big for two people and make good use of the fruit as well. Now, expanding on that idea, we have the garden because the garden space is also much too big for two people. But I have plans actually for making it even a little bit bigger. I have plans for growing lots and lots of root vegetables and squash uh, for the pigs, maybe some other things, but definitely um, beets and turnips and rutabagas and um, all kinds of things that pigs love and those giant squashes and pumpkins, you know, that those plants can provide a lot of food that we don't have to purchase then if if we can grow it the chickens will get to eat all kinds of greens and tomatoes and cucumbers after i've taken out what i need of course i might turn them loose in there they'll help keep the bug population down now we also have quail uh, scott can eat those eggs and we both love the meat now speaking of eggs a couple of days ago we went on a treasure hunt we came back with eight Canadian goose eggs. That is equivalent to two dozen chicken eggs in just a little morning walk of about 10 minutes. So every morning on my way to bring in the cows, I passed by this goose nest. First I saw two eggs, then three, then four, then five. The nest was in a horrible place. It was less than two feet from where I and the cows walked twice a day a day and it's also in a place where a huge spring rain would flood the area and wipe it out we have to cross this little stream and it, it floods down in there when it rains hard so the eggs stopped increasing after five and i wondered if the nest had been abandoned you know perhaps that pair of geese had gotten fed up with us interrupting their family situation two times every day and it gave me an idea a little bit of history about the geese back in 2009 or 2010 we got our first pair of or maybe two pair of geese making their home on our ponds we have two ponds the older pond is about an acre and the newer one established in 2007 or 2008 it's about an acre and a half and for the first couple of years they nested hatched a batch of goslings and then left for the winter and i'm not sure exactly when that changed but now they are with us year round and about a week or so ago, I counted 36 of them, three dozen geese. Every year, the total gets larger. And there are usually at least three nests, sometimes four. I don't know, maybe there's five or six because there's two out front. And there's usually three or four out on near or around the island. So anyway, some years, most of the goslings don't even survive and but some years they increase the flock by a couple of dozen it just depends and not all have stayed of course but but as i said we are up to three dozen birds at this point and uh, that's a lot of squawking geese and a lot of little green poops everywhere 
Hence my idea. What if we raided their nests and took the eggs? That would reduce the increase in population and give us another great source of food. It's only going to happen in the spring, but they are great. We found two other nests besides the one that had the five in it, but only one had any eggs. We had three eggs in that other one. And the gander guarding that nest tried to give us a flogging. I'll tell you what, he was fierce, but we persevered. That pair nest in the same place every year. Unlikely she will lay some more eggs. I'm kind of undecided about snatching those as well. But like I said, reducing the population would be a good thing, or at least not allowing it to grow quite so much. So that particular pair, as I said, nests on uh, the island in a larger pond. And there's also another pair that regularly nests on the other side of that island. But there, I saw them, but there was... There was no nest yet. I think we might have had three nests on that island at one point, actually. Another one over by the weeping willow tree. But anyway, there are at least two pairs also that uh, regularly nest up by the older pond. And we found a nest up there, but there were no eggs in that one. And it is still early. How it works is, they're, well, their normal egg activity kind of goes like this. They will lay one egg each day, usually in the morning, and then they'll cover the nest and go away. And this be, at this point, the goose isn't incubating the eggs. Now, eventually, after anywhere from four to nine eggs are laid, that's for Canadian geese, they'll lay four to nine eggs, averages five. Um, she'll begin to sit on the nest and warm the eggs and begin the incubation process at, at that time. And then the gander stands guard, and as I said, they can be fierce. And then once a day, the goose will leave the nest to go feed. And then it takes an average of of, 28 days for the eggs to hatch. Uh, So every year near the end of April, I start looking for goslings. So it is still a little bit early. Actually, right now, this last week of March would be when they would start laying those eggs. And like on the 1st of April last March, 1st of April, that's when they start actually setting and incubating those eggs. So I don't know, I might go out there and and grab a few more, but my refrigerator is so full of milk at this point. I don't know. Spring is always the abundance, abundance in spring. Now I'm afraid to try the eggs because of the ordeal that I had with the quail eggs. And if you don't know about that, go back and listen to my podcast, Am I Allergic to Quail Eggs? And I'll leave a link in the show notes. Scott is loving them. I may give them a try as I had them in the past and I had no issues. Duck eggs give me a rash. Quail eggs, that's a whole different level of issue. But these uh, goose eggs, they look like chicken eggs and they actually taste pretty much like a chicken egg. So you break one into your frying pan and it just about takes up a whole, our little six inch frying pan. Big yolk bunch of white around it. Anyway, it's kind of cool. But there's a picture on Facebook if you'd like to go take a look at that. Uh, Let me finish up the homestead updates with some info on the creamery. Doors with locks, windows with lovely sills are all completed. Scott is currently working on the roof over the barn and milking parlor. Completely separate roof that connects in with the previous roof. And once that's completed, the metal roofing will go on all of it. Then the plumbing, electrical installation will begin. Somewhere along the way, the milking stanchions and the milking pipeline system will be installed under that barn that he's roofing right now. We have all the pieces and parts sitting off to the side, just waiting for their opportunity to contribute to the final product. After that, walls, ceilings, and tile floors, bathroom fixtures, kitchen appliances, various stainless steel tables, carts, and shelves will magically appear. Who knows what else? It has been a little over three years perhaps at the end of four years there will be much light at the end of the tunnel so that's it for the overview of what our homestead is growing into let us know what you think now i want to talk just a little bit about this coronavirus and how it is affecting us Um, i know you've probably heard too much about it already uh, but i just feel the need for us to come together and understand each other help each other out in a time of need and grow into better human beings I uh, I walked out the front door this morning and I'm looking at the world around me. It's glorious. It, this is by far my favorite part of every day. It is 
it just is what it is and nothing else. There's no noisy traffic. It, there's only the sound of birds. You know, sometimes you might hear a cow mooing, a donkey braying, a sheep or a goat baying. The geese are always over there in the pound, a pond making a racket. Or, or at the very least, they do this low rumbling squawk and they're splashing around in the water. Now, this time of year, the sun has not risen above the trees but the the but the sky is light and there might be a soft breeze and it it was i don't know 40ish this morning and i was dressed for the weather so it was just lovely anyway so i walked out the front door this morning i looked at the world around me and as i walked down the path to go bring the cows in for milking and or practice the milking routine i thought to myself these cows know nothing about what is going on in our world it was just one of those things that struck me squarely in the heart. We have finally been affected by the pandemic restrictions. Farmers markets in Virginia are ordered to close for about a month. And the farmers market is my primary drop-off point for my herd share customers. And I do sell a bit of product there, but mainly I use, I, I just, that's when I meet my herd share peeps. But fortunately, drop-offs are still allowed for farmer's markets, and um, likely I'll meet uh, my peeps in the parking lot at the usual time, as long as they are willing. I have hand sanitizer. This is small potatoes compared to the disruption in the lives of those around us. And Scott and I are fortunate that we live where we do with nature all around us. We are naturally isolated, you know, keeping our distance from large crowds and society in general. Our lives revolve around the many tasks and responsibilities of raising animals, and it is a full life. Going to farmer's market is a treat for me, a, a chance to meet people, have some conversations with other humans besides Scott. A trip to the grocery store is usually made in conjunction with a trip to drop off product for the online independence farmer's market or the twice monthly Withville farmer's market. We just don't go out much. We save on gas that way. We were, we're going to church every week. I think it's hard for me sometimes to understand the deep gouge this coronavirus restriction has put in the normal person's life. We're not normal people. <laughs> We've chosen a different life. However, I do remember when I was I was flying every week and my life revolved around teaching classrooms full of doctors, nurses, and sports staff. I provide instructions in how to use the U.S. military's custom-designed electronic health record. Yeah, that was my job. Uh, interestingly enough, I got sick a few times during that five years of intense travel and exposure to one hospital or clinic after another. Since we left that world over, well, it's a bit over three years ago, I have yet to have even a sniffle. Even before we left those jobs for the homestead, we worked in a hospital setting. It, it was this, it was the same one. We weren't traveling so much then. But we must have built up immunity to all the bugs because Scott and I have rarely been sick with any kind of flu or virus. I'm going to say at least over the last eight or ten years. But it was trippy there for a while, especially if I worked in a pediatric setting. I'm pretty sure I caught something every single time I worked in that environment. Those kids carry all kinds of bugs. And in 2009, just over 10 years ago, the H1N1 was the center of our world for a while. Likely most of you don't remember it. Uh, we geared up quickly, as is happening now, and many people stepped up to the plate to battle this new danger. All sorts of new procedures were put in place. I worked with the healthcare staff to develop new workflows for documenting very rapidly when the vaccine came out. That was in the fall. The H1N1 actually started April, I believe it was April of 2009, but it was September or October before they had a vaccine. And then we had drive up processing that was set up, tents were set up, all kinds of things were put in place to address the demand for the vaccine. So the, so the H1N1 was the last pandemic disease. Uh, before that, it was MERS and SARS. Those were all both, or those were also declared pandemics. And we handled them all, and we will handle this one as well. The big difference here is the shutdown of society, and that is huge. And I, I know some of you are frightened to death, and others are just calmly doing what needs to be done. We're on the calmer end here. Some of you are at greater risk than others, and so, yeah, your anxiety level is going to be higher. I just turned 65 last week. Technically, I'm in a high-risk category. Uh, though, again, I'm one of those completely unconcerned about contracting this virus. 
We live a life of isolation and we are also very healthy. If we were to contract it, we would be one of the, I don't know, what is it, 80 or 90 percent where it's it's like a cold, you know, and it just doesn't do much. The, the making of butter, cheese, yogurt, that ensures I wash my hands many, many times in any given day. It's just part of my life to uh, practice that kind of cleanliness. So I don't worry about it too much. Many of you are at risk and or you have family members that are at risk, young and old. I actually, I have a 95 year old aunt. She lives with and is well taken care of by her daughter, but she can only wave at her son through a window because he works in healthcare. Scott's daughter is a nurse. So our healthcare workers put themselves in danger every single day. So we pray for them. Some of you are out of work and don't know when you'll get another paycheck. So many of us have lived from paycheck to paycheck. I, I can't imagine. I can't imagine that stress. Some of you own small businesses and are also wondering how will you survive. I, I just, I feel so bad for some of these small businesses. If you can purchase gift certificates or buy takeout for the restaurants or whatever, whatever you can do to help these guys out. If you still have a job. Now, if you don't have a job, you, you've got to take care of yourself. But but uh, some of you are working from home. But the kids are there as well, right? Because <laughs> school's out. Uh, what a challenge that must present. That stress must be off the scale for you. My heart goes out to you. Hundreds of thousands of our fellow Americans and millions around the world have had their lives completely turned upside down. What, what are we going to do? How will we survive? Is it an overreaction? I don't know. We'll never know. We worship now via streaming video. It's not the same, but we are together in spirit. And I actually get to see worship service every morning now, where before I would always miss miss the morning service because it's an hour for us to drive. Um, so we would only go once a week. I really appreciate the effort our church is putting into keeping us spiritually connected with, with each other and God. Last night was, um, it was a parish check-in, which was, it was, this, I don't even know what the platform is called, some kind of a, a thing where you dialed in and you could even, you could see each other on the screen. Uh, it was pretty cool. Anyway, I know I look at social media too much. There are all sorts of stories of people who are worried for their families. Then there are the stories of folks like us who can't really relate to intense fear. I mean, we're, we're cautious, we're aware, but we don't live in that environment. And from my perspective, some of the precautions seem a bit excessive. The CDC has said social distancing is a must, but I don't think they mentioned anything about shutting down much of the country, literally shutting it down. <laughs> I'm probably going to get a lot of hate over this, but I just don't see the need. When does the cure become more painful or harmful than the disease? I just don't know. And but again, I don't live in a highly populated urban center or city with lots of sick people and immunocompromised compromised people. But I do know of these people and I do know that every year they are faced with he, these kinds of health, health epidemics and it, it is always stressful. This is another one on top of the other. So we've never had to completely shut down in response to a pandemic. And uh, again, we've had one every few years. I hear people say this. This one is different. It's repeated over and over. And that same phrase was repeated over and over in 2009 as well. You know, H1N1 was different. But that's, that is what pandemic means. A new disease spreading easily from person to person. Widespread over multiple countries. That's what pandemic means. And each and every one of them is new. And it's going to be different from the last one because it's new. Anyway, I try to cheer myself up. It's a mess out there. I know it's a mess out there. But in the in the end, we'll all get through this. I have such great compassion and empathy for all of you struggling with a life term topsy-turvy. And if I came across as insensitive earlier, I apologize. My personality at, at this time of my life is one of calm reason. I, um, you know, I know people whose natural level of anxiety would prevent them from being able to experience their life this way. And having experienced periods of extreme anxiety throughout my life, I can completely relate. And I'm ready, willing, and able to listen, comfort, and reassure. Because I'm in the place to offer that hand now. And I understand where you're coming from. And along those lines, there are some really great stories going on out there. 
companies stepping up to the plate and retooling their factories like overnight to make masks and hand sanitizer and ventilators. And I saw all kinds of patterns for homemade masks this morning while I was browsing some social media posts. There's lots of love out there for the truckers who are keeping the food flowing. Though the hoarding is a bit disturbing. It, I do not think that we will run out of food. Truckers live isolated lives and also, also are considered essential. The food will keep moving. And the toilet paper thing is just bizarre to me. I mean, when you think about, oh my gosh, the world is ending. Let me go buy toilet paper. I don't get that. <laughs> I don't get that. And how about those folks that are working in grocery stores and pharmacies also putting themselves out there. I know, I know they're doing it for the money. They actually still have jobs, but they got to be thinking that any one of the people they come in contact with could be a carrier just waiting to infect them and their families. You know, they go home, they have kids and whatnot. You know, you got to be worried about, about these people and our healthcare workers are, are being stressed at this time. So keep them in your prayers. I remember the stress of 2009, uh, lots of our health care workers got sick. All were tired and overworked. I mean, it was brutal. We um, supported each other and all was well in the end. You know, let's let's keep up the prayers for these special people who put their lives on the line to help others. Now, we don't know how long this will last. And that uncertainty is a huge stressor in and of itself. One thing I do know is that each and every one of you is doing everything you can to get us all through this with as little harm as possible. And there are some great things happening. I mean, you know, school may be changed forever. In this age of technology, homeschooling may make a resurgence like never before. And I realize this is not a good thing for some of you, but for many you can take the education of your children back into your own hands. I've seen the articles regarding how far education has moved from traditional reading, writing, and arithmetic and life skills like home economics and shop into every social, political, and sexual arena possible and not in an age-appropriate manner. These things are disturbing to me, uh, the way that our children are being educated. So hopefully we're going to be able to take some of that back and there'll be smaller groups Maybe not necessarily what it's called homeschooling, but maybe, uh, well, it would be a type of homeschooling, but maybe as these online resources proliferate, smaller groups of children learning together. You could be in this person's house this week and another person's house the next, you know, and, and parents sharing the educational responsibilities. You know, location is malleable as long as there's internet. I guess I won't work for those without a good internet connection. That still uh, does still happen, especially in this area. Any rural area with mountains can sometimes have internet speed and connectivity issues. But overall, I think education will improve for the better. It will be much less expensive. Online college is coming and coming quickly. And with every pandemic exercise, New and improved methods of protecting that most vulnerable group of people that we love so much are put into place. Think of it. The whole scientific medical community is focused on combating this virus. There will be innovations like we have never seen that will come out of this. Something as small as a new workflow, an isolation procedure, or sanitizing solution can make a huge difference when the next pandemic arrives. We are so innovative when it comes to survival. And think of the new medical treatments that might come out of it. The, the, the possibilities are just endless. You know, I think I've rambled on long enough here. I'm going to close out this podcast. We're all in this together and we will get through it. This is a tough time for so many of you. My life is relative to yours, unchanged. And that frees me up to assist you. If you're having particular issues and would like to talk to someone, drop me an email and let's see if we can set up a time to talk on the phone. And if you know someone who would benefit from my message, please share this content with them. Thank you so much for stopping by the homestead. And until next time, may God fill your life with grace and peace.